As 2022 comes to a close, many Magic the Gathering players are asking the question, what were the best and worst things to happen in Magic the Gathering this, the year 2022? Well, let's begin with the awesome Warhammer Commander decks that, huh? What's that? It's 2023. Oh my God, another year went by, I didn't even notice it. Well, that's great. So yes, what went right and what went wrong in this 2023? What even happened in 2023? Well, this video will actually focus on the good, the best things to happen in Magic the Gathering, be they products or even just decisions and initiatives by Wizards of the Coast. So yes, it's the positive video. Here we do the positive video and then on Friday, it will be our worst of selection. But for now, let's really look at the good, the great things that happened in Magic the Gathering. As always, where there were tons of awesome things going on in the community, I like these videos to highlight specifically things that Magic the Gathering officially did. What happened in the game itself that is worthy of praise and celebration. So for example, really awesome events like KubeCon won't be mentioned here, awesome though they may have been because that simply was a community-led effort and not an official Wizards of the Coast initiative. Though, speaking of Cube, that is a great segue into, whoa, Cubamajigs and Potamajigs sponsor of this video. Cubamajigs are reusable, resealable packs for Magic the Gathering cards and other standard size gaming cards. It's essentially a plastic booster pack that holds 15 sleeved cards and has a flap that opens and closes so that it can be used and reused again and again. But Cubamajig's resealable booster packs aren't just for cube lovers. I use these for my jumpstart packs, where I place a jumpstart half deck in each Cubamajig pack and thus can get endless and replayable games of jumpstart, all thanks to Cubamajigs. And with Potamajigs, you now have the perfect storage option for your 360, 450, or 540 card cube, with room for lands, tokens, and more. Potamajigs is a durable, heavy-duty storage box with an interior tray designed to hold cards, dice, tokens, or whatever else you can think of. And again, each box features stunning artwork from famed artists, including Magic favorites. The tray can fit a 540 card cube comfortably and still have room for basic basic lands, dice, and tokens, or just do what I do and use some of the Potamajigs to store nine double-sleeved EDH decks and still have room for tokens. Using Potamajigs to store your cube or your EDH decks is like building your own premium boxed game experience that you can pull off the shelf and play anytime. I actually have several Potamajigs designed with commander decks that are meant to be played against one another, where friends will come over and pull one of their choice out. It's like a commander board game that I got to help make. That's pretty cool. Available with international shipping, I will link to the Cardamajigs and Cubamajigs website in this video's description. Links to ordering are in this video's description, and thank you, Cubamajigs and Potamajigs, for sponsoring this video. Before we begin our countdown proper, there is an honorable mention that I want to highlight, and that is what I feel has been the successful return to the gathering of magic. In other words, 2023 was not only an amazing year for Magic the Gathering events, but it has been, I think, the year that really solidified that Magic events, even organized play and the Pro Tour itself, are back. And again, I am talking about things that are specifically under the oversight, under the oversight, is that right? It sounds right, under the oversight of Wizards of the Coast itself. Specifically, the amazing job Wizards of the Coast themselves did with the stunning spectacle of their Magicon series, all the way down to the return of the Pro Tour. That's right, the Pro Tour is back, baby. First held in 1996, the Pro Tour was the premier tournament for competitive Magic players to prove their skill on an international stage. In 2018, however, the Pro Tour was phased out in favor of Mythic Championships and the Magic Pro League. While these events did produce some fantastic moments in high-level gameplay, many Magic the Gathering players lamented the loss of the classic Paper Pro Tour, and overall interest seemed to wane to the point that the Magic Pro League went away. But now, after years of changes and uncertainty, 2023 marked the first full season of competitive Magic under the newly restructured organized play system. One of the most important aspects 
aspects of this restructuring is the greatly simplified path for competitive players to reach the Pro Tour. To qualify, players must compete in the Regional Championship Qualifiers, otherwise known as RCQs, which are hosted by local game stores. What a concept! Doing well enough there earns an invite to the Regional Championships, and doing well there earns an invite to the Pro Tour. The competitive magic year culminates in the World Championship in the fall, featuring the best players from each Pro Tour event. The simplified structure not only makes it easier to envision one's own path to the World Championship, but also makes following competitive magic as a fan a much more enjoyable experience. But the Pro Tour did not happen in isolation. Instead, each Pro Tour event went hand in hand with a Magic Con, or Magic Convention, which is a giant spectacle event featuring the best the Magic community has to offer. Casual play, unique side events, artists, content creators, cosplayers. The list goes on and on, but these events were not just another version of the old GPs. They truly became a new and unique experience for all those attending, where Magic players from casual to competitive could now gather, sling spells, make new friends, watch the Pro Tour live, and just celebrate their love for this great game. It's just so genuinely exciting for paper competitive magic events to once again be a central rallying point for the community. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing what comes next in 2024. But now let's get to the list proper and really celebrate some of the best things to happen in Magic the Gathering this year. Coming in at number five, it's, what does that say? Magic Arena. Is that right? Magic Arena? Yes! Magic Arena, specifically the return of one of the most beloved blocks of all Magic the Gathering history, Cons of Tarkir Remastered. Or rather, one of the most beloved sets, Cons of Tarkir Remastered by just giving us Cons of Tarkir. It's a winning formula. Hey, it's no secret that I'm a fan of remastered sets, and the digital landscape is no exception to that fanaticism. When done correctly, a remastered set lets us enjoy drafting a set or block of sets from Magic the Gathering's past, something that the price of old booster boxes, often, always, makes financially prohibitive. And Cons of Tarkir was one of the greatest Magic the Gathering sets of all time, but who can afford a booster box? Well now, you can experience the joy of drafting cons on Magic Arena, and for existing Magic Arena players, the amazing cards from that set are also now available for all your deck building desires. Unlike previous remastered releases like Amonkhet and Innistrad, Khans Remastered is a one-to-one -one port of all 269 cards from the original set. Oh my god, this by itself, I just loved that decision. Wish they all were like that on Arena. Released in September of 2014, oh my god, I'm old, Khans of Tarkir introduced us to one of Magic's most unique and iconic settings. Tarkir is a brutal plane ruled by the ambitious and ruthless Khans, each vying for control of a wild landscape once ruled by long extinct dragons. An incredibly popular block and setting, many Magic the Gathering players have been clamoring for a return to Tarkir, and the chance to play with this incredible set on Arena for the first time is a great preamble to our eventual revisit in 2025. If you've never played with this set, you might wonder, what makes it so good? The limited format is widely considered to be one of the best ever for a variety of reasons. Theming the set around the three color wedges, Abzan, Sultai, Teemer, Jeskai, and Mardu, keeps things fresh by opening up a variety of choices during a draft. Besides the three color clan archetypes, multiple two color and even five color decks are possible, incentivizing drafters to keep coming back to try new builds. The morph mechanic also goes a long way towards making combat in limited more interesting, since you'll have to keep even more potential tricks in mind when your opponent has mana untapped. But it's not just limited either. Cons of Tarkir introduces dozens of iconic and powerful cards to Arena's card pool for the first time. Fetch lands are certainly the headliner here, as they improve mana bases in Arena's eternal formats drastically, but there are many, many more. Spells with the incredibly strong delve mechanic are already making an impact on Arena-constructed formats, with powerful staples like Dig Through Time and Treasure Cruise leading the way. There's also a lot to love for Brawl players here, with a ton of multicolored commanders being added to the format, in addition to fun, flashy cards like 
villainous wealth, see the unwritten, and deflecting palm. Constructed arena players can now also use the ascendancy and charm cycles for the first time, opening up new avenues for building multicolored decks. In my opinion, Cons of Tarkir is everything arena should be doing and doing more of, taking sets from throughout Magic the Gathering's history and offering them in their glorious perfection as a remastered set. And while I am also a fan of taking multiple sets and curating them as a new remastered singular draft experience, here with Cons of Tarkir, I'm so happy this was a one-to-one -one port. I love that the draft experience, being what it was, is now something that we can experience again, or for many people, for the first time. I love that we now have the entire library of cards to choose and build from on Arena, and this is one of the best things to happen in 2023 for certain. I hope that we continue to get sets like this on Arena every year. Hey, maybe my best of 2024 video will be celebrating, I don't know, what do you think? Shards of Alara remastered on Arena? I also wish that we got remastered experiences like this in paper more often too. Oh, and that brings me to number four. That's right, just like the Pro Tour and Cons of Tarkir remastered, the next best thing to happen in Magic the Gathering in 2023 is something that actually happened before 2023 and is brought back again from Magic's past, and that is Dominaria Remastered. I love remastered sets, and Dominaria Remastered is no exception. Just like with Time Spiral Remastered, I did an entire fake-out gushing video from my Truth Of series, just going on and on about how awesome Dominaria Remastered was. Though, Dominaria Remastered was done somewhat differently to Time Spiral Remastered. In Time Spiral Remastered, an entire block was remastered into one set, but Dominaria Remastered pulled from 27 different sets that all took place on Magic the Gathering's OG plane of Dominaria, Alpha, Legends, The Dark, Urza's Block, Invasion, Judgment. Experiencing these sets is something thought by many to be lost to time, but this huge variety of cards from across some of Magic's most impactful and iconic early sets was now ours to experience again. Not to mention rendered in gorgeous retro and borderless treatments. What's even more impressive is how the set's designers collated all of these cards into a cohesive and incredibly enjoyable draft experience. I mean, I was actually a little nervous about that at first, because these sets sets weren't made to be drafted together. Some of them weren't made to be drafted at all, and yet the draft environment for Dominaria Remastered it was truly top-notch. It was some of the most fun I've had drafting of anything of this year. And there's actually been a lot of really good draft environments this year. Hey, draft, let's get to that. What was so cool besides the joy and nostalgia of seeing older cards in a new context was that the set supported fun and novel archetypes like red-white auras, red-black zombies and goblins, green-white threshold, and even the return of The Rock. I, I mean, just like, yeah, you want to draft Dominaria Remastered? I'm going to draft The Rock. It's so cool. While the quality of draft was indeed great. Dominaria Remastered also featured many, many needed reprints of staple cards from a variety of formats. Obviously, you should definitely draft this set if you ever have the opportunity, but even today, a year after the set came out more or less, you can still find affordable singles from it for your constructed decks. So while it did affect the price of cards like Force of Will, Sylvan Library, Urza's Incubator, and Yogmothran Physician, it also made cards like Sneak Attack, Entomb, and Mystic Remora available and more affordable, not to mention cards like Maze of If and Exploration. So even for Commander players who aren't looking to draft, this was a set that had a positive effect on their experience and access to this game. Best of all, Dominaria Remastered was available at an affordable price, so while many of the cards within this remastered set did not have a huge price tag on them, experiencing the set as a draft was much more affordable, and brought with it the added bonus of walking away with a few classic cards and cool art treatments for use in your constructed decks. Or, you know, just the fact that you could buy singles because they were mere... Or just, you know, the fact... Or, you know, that you could buy singles of what you wanted for the decks you wanted to play because the prices became much more affordable. It's win-win for one of the best specialty sets of 2023. Coming in at number three, we have a set that brought us some of the most needed reprints for Commander. <laughs> no, it's not Commander Masters. 
definitely not Commander Masters, because this set actually offered those reprints at an affordable price. It's Wilds of Eldraine, or more specifically, the Wilds of Eldraine bonus sheet. Not since Strixhaven has a bonus sheet been this juiced with awesome needed reprints, both in terms of high ticket cards, as well as making sure the lower priced ones are still cards that see play. Best of all, these cards were given superlative new artwork and treatments and all of this, all of this was just a bonus added to regularly priced packs of Magic the Gathering. Enchanting Tales includes 103 cards, all of which are notable enchantments from across Magic's history. Like bonus sheets that came before, Enchanting Tales has two major exciting qualities. It added an interesting texture to the limited environment of Wilds of Eldraine, and it proved an opportunity to reprint many expensive cards that didn't really make sense to reprint in other sets. I don't know if you can tell from this list so far, but we're big fans of needed reprints here at TCC, and Enchanting Tales had some whoppers. Just see if any of these cards ring a bell. Rhystic Study, Smothering Tithe, Doubling Season. Pretty sweet that these came inside of regularly priced Magic the Gathering packs. Suck it, Commander Masters, because Enchanting Tales also included cards like Sneak Attack, Parallel Lives, Kindred Discovery, all of which led many Magic the Gathering players to say that this bonus sheet was the better Commander Masters. But it's not just the flashy ones like Fiery Emancipation or Land Tax. The bonus sheet also gave players easier access to fun and useful enchantments at a greatly reduced price, with classics like Hardened Scales, As Foretold, and Goblin Bombardment becoming more accessible than ever for budget Commander players. It was a slam dunk selection and offered at the right price, which was to say no additional price at all. It was a bonus. Buy regular packs, get great cards. Plus, some of the new art for these reprints is pretty dang nifty. Nifty, don't you think? The fact that you could open these cards in regular draft boosters provided that extra bit of incentive to draft the set at your local game store. It's such a win for the players. You can have a fantastic time drafting and maybe, just maybe, open a really exciting reprint for your commander deck. Best of all, if Mark Rosewater's survey on his Tumblr blog this year is any indication, these sheets are going to be a fixture of standard set releases going forward. Huh, I guess 2023 has been a pretty good year, and you know, as we approach our number two pick, it does fill me with joy knowing that there were so many great things to happen, not just in Magic the Gathering this year, but even in gaming. For example, 2023 saw the release of a product that I got to collaborate on, the Round the Table collection of multiplayer precons designed for flesh and blood. They put me on a card! All right, so they literally asked me to collaborate on this product and they put me on a card, so if you'll indulge me for just this short digression, I gotta say it's awesome to see how much Flesh and Blood itself as a game has grown. And yes, getting to be a part of that, not just being on a card, but by bringing this amazing product to shelves at local game stores. This awesome experience for people who wanna get into Flesh and Blood, maybe play it casually in multiplayer, or upgrade those decks to something more competitive. All of that was certainly a highlight for me. I really think it's important to have a diverse marketplace in gaming because games like Flesh and Blood, if nothing else, keep games like Magic the Gathering on its toes, pushing it to try more and to do better. You know, Flesh and Blood has one of the best competitive circuits around, and they developed that during a time when Magic the Gathering was, let's be honest, kind of abandoning its own competitive circuit. But now, one of the best things to happen in Magic the Gathering this year has been the return to organized play and the Pro Tour. Was that because they felt the fires from Flesh and Blood? I think maybe it played at least a small part, and that's why I'm so excited for the next Flesh and Blood release. Heavy hitters whose pre-release events will run between January 26th and 29th at your local game store. Among awesome things like the Deathmatch Arena where Ultimate Pit Fight meets Booster Draft and the return of the expansion slot, Heavy Hitters brings with it exciting new heroes like KO, Armed and Dangerous. KO, Armed and Dangerous is a new brute hero who will also feature in his very own pre-constructed Blitz deck. With KO as your hero, you will show no fear, eh? As you face your opponents in the mighty deathmatch arena. What's the loss of an arm when he can still deliver both an agile and mighty windup? to those who dare stand in his or your way. If you've never taken part in a Flesh and Blood pre-release event, mark your calendars for January as they are an experience not to be missed. Or, you know, just pick up around the table at your local game store and shuffle up and play with these awesome multiplayer Blitz decks. It's been an awesome year for gaming and an awesome year for Flesh and Blood, and 
with heavy hitters hitting stores at the end of January and bringing with it cool new heroes, well, 2024 is off to a resounding start. So what exactly is the number two best thing to happen in Magic the Gathering in 2023? Moving now from the wilds of Eldraine to the infinite expanse of time and space, at number two, we have the Doctor Who Commander decks. And all right, before you start firing away a lot of comments in this video's description with shouts of biased, hear me out here. While it's true that I have a definitely healthy obsession with the Doctor Who series, these Commander decks also introduced a huge number of mechanically interesting cards to the format while also properly honoring the legacy of the source material. This release consisted of four pre-constructed Commander decks, each of which focused on a different aspect of Doctor Who history. What made these decks so successful is how well the flavor of each deck tied to its overarching mechanical themes. Blast from the Past, for example, highlighted what you might call the classic era of Doctor Who, and was mechanically themed around historic cards. And if you really want to hear what made Blast from the Past such an amazing deck, you can watch my reveal on it here. Meanwhile, the Masters of Evil deck was all about the Doctor's iconic rogues gallery of villains. The mechanical theme of this deck, Villainous Choice, tied perfectly into the fantasy of being the dastardly antagonist of the Commander table. The other two decks, Timey Wimey and Paradox Power, introduced novel mechanical themes that weren't really feasible to build a deck around before, those themes being suspend and casting spells from outside of your hand, respectively. The decks also contained a ton of high-end reprints, and their mana bases may have been the most powerful for a commander precon in some time, if not ever. I'm still in awe of the fact that these decks had mana bases that included not just temples, but also slow lands and check lands, they even had horizon lands in each of these decks. Whereas a lot of universes beyond cards are often criticized as just being sold based on the flavor of their corresponding IP, the Doctor Who cards in these Commander decks dove deep into the mechanical possibilities of Magic the Gathering. So much so that they probably weren't a really good starting point for new players, but brought to existing players new possibilities, new directions, and new ideas never before seen on Magic cards. And also, yeah, those great mana bases and reprints. Hey, everybody wins! Each Doctor even had an associated Saga card that mechanically referenced an iconic episode from that Doctor's run. It's immediately obvious from reading these cards that the designers of this set are passionate fans of the franchise, and it makes playing with the decks all the more enjoyable as a result. Truly, and I mean this truly, I feel Doctor Who Commander decks took magic in a new direction, I think really encapsulating the idea of universes beyond. For years to come, the cards created here will be discussion points, museum pieces even. It was a fantastic home run of an exploration of all Magic the Gathering could do. And B. But if the Doctor Who Commander decks are taking Magic the Gathering in new directions, then our number one pick is truly something that took Magic back to its roots. So what Magic the Gathering release this year could possibly dethrone Doctor Who from our number one spot? Well... Yeah, I'm gonna level with you here. If you told me three years ago that I would have not one, but two Universes Beyond releases on my year-end list, I'd be a little concerned for you, and maybe even a little concerned for me. Even today, and even with my love of Doctor Who, if there were a button I could push that made it so that Magic the Gathering never brought in an outside IP, that Magic the Gathering kept its cards and aesthetic purely Magic the Gathering, I'd probably push that button in a heartbeat. And I love Doctor Who. So given that, you know that when I occupy not one, but two of the top slots with Universes Beyond products, it means they were really genuinely very good. Hey, I said the Warhammer Commander decks were one of the best things of their respective year, and I don't even like Warhammer, but they were really good Commander decks, and here, the number one pick is the IP that in some ways started all that Magic the Gathering became, all that just about any fantasy series became, and that of course is Lord of the Rings and the Tales of Middle-Earth set. It's hard to know even where to begin because this was such a major, major event this year, but let's start with the base set, stripping away the Commander decks, stripping away the re-release and holiday packs and collector boosters and jumpstart packs. Were there jumpstart packs? Yeah, there were jumpstart packs and arena starter kits and all of that noise. Let's just focus on the base Lord of the Rings set, the actual draft set and cards that everything else was built upon. 
and that by itself was an incredible work of art. And I don't just mean the art, which itself was incredible, but the design of these cards, both individually and as a set, was one of the best Magic the Gathering sets, universes beyond or within, that was made this year. I honestly believe that buying a draft booster box of Tales of Middle-Earth gets you one of the best Magic the Gathering experiences there is. Better than Dominaria Remastered, better than any of the standard sets of this year, better than any of the premium sets of this year, Tales of Middle-Earth took Magic the Gathering all the way back to its core. Art isn't the only great aspect of this set. As with the Doctor Who release, the development team of Tales of Middle-Earth did a fantastic job conveying flavor through game mechanics. Frodo, Sauron's bane, can win the game by carrying the ring all the way to Mordor, also known as your opponent's face. And when Gandalf, White Rider, dies, he returns at the dawn of the fifth day. One of my personal favorites, Gimli and Legolas, Counter of Kills, literally stack up counters when your opponent's creatures die. And the ring tempting mechanic also interacts with multiple cards in really flavorful ways. But maybe the single best achievement of Tales of Middle-Earth is that it served as an on-ramp for new Magic players. While your average fantasy enthusiast may not be familiar with Magic the Gathering, there's a roughly 100% chance that they're familiar with Lord of the Rings. The fact that these mechanics are so resonant flavor-wise is not only so satisfying, but also makes it easier for newer players to get into and grasp the game. I have heard numerous anecdotes about new players asking their friends to teach them Magic the Gathering because of the Lord of the Rings set. And that right there is one of the most positive things that you can get out of a Universes Beyond product such as this. And best of all, the set was accessible to new players, something I fear the Doctor Who decks were probably not. Not to mention the beautiful art and style which brought the foundation of all fantasy writing to life in the cards in our hands. It's no wonder that Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle-Earth became the biggest selling Magic the Gathering set of all times. It was in many ways a Magic the Gathering set for everybody. And while many of the items on our list will hold a special place in Magic players' hearts, I do feel truly that the impact the real impact of Tales of Middle-Earth will be felt for many years to come. And I don't just mean because the One Ring and Orcish Bowmasters are broken. Though that, along with other poor choices, may in fact be discussed in Friday's video about the worst things to happen in Magic the Gathering this year. But now, for now, I want to hear from you, and I want to focus on the good. What other great things happened in Magic the Gathering in 2023? Remember, I want to focus not on any awesome community-led efforts, though feel free to mention those and shout them out as well, but really on the actual products, decisions, and implementations made by Wizards of the Coast for this game that we all love. Let me know in the comments below. And remember, this video was brought to you by Potamajigs and Cubamajigs. If you are looking for an awesome way to store your own packs of Magic the Gathering cards, from packs for cube to packs for jumpstart to just tokens and dice for use in your existing deck boxes, or go full force with a Potamajig storage pod with its 1,000 card capacity that can hold a 360, 450, or 540 card cube with room for lands, tokens, and more, just, you know, nine double-sleeved EDH decks plus tokens, then check out Potamajigs and Cubamajigs via Hitpoint Press. Link in this video's description, and thank you for sponsoring this video.